Some people would think that you know, we send our kids to school to pass, pass tests, um, to pass tests to go to university, to get a good job. Well, we know that, that getting a, a degree at a good university doesn't guarantee a good job uh, or, or a job for life anymore. So, that, so the system has changed. Um, but also we have to think about perhaps another way of looking at education and the purpose of education is to enable present and future generations to thrive um, in our society. So this is a, it's a, it's a very different way of looking at things. And you know, one might question, is education's role to produce uh, human capital, if you like, for the workforce? And I'm not sure that that's, I mean, partly you want to be able to thrive and, and to be able to thrive, you need to be able to dis- invent your own job or, 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 or to, to get some sort of gainful employment. But I think part of education's role is, and, and thriving, is how we get along with each other. Now, to give you an example, if you look at the, uh, the Harvard Longitudinal Study, which is the longest study of what it takes to, to live well in the world, you know, to be healthy and, and happy and, and, and so forth, and live, live, live long, um, what they discovered, actually, and this, I mean, they, they studied many people, and these people are now in their, in their late 80s, but actually, it wasn't about their, uh, their degree, their educational standing. It wasn't about where they lived or their wealth. Uh, what it was was about good relationships. The, the key to a long life, a happy, healthy life, is good relationships. Relationships with your partner, relationships with your neighbours and so forth. And yet, nothing in our education systems today uh, work towards that. So I think we, are, we have an education system today which is probably perfectly adequate um, for the second industrial revolution, factories, offices, and, and that kind of thing. Um, you know, a good example would be uh, London taxi drivers. Um, you would spend four years learning something called the knowledge, memorizing the roads of London, all the back streets and all that kind of stuff. And then overnight, we're replaced by an app that you could download onto your phone. And I think that's a really good metaphor or, or analogy, sorry, for the education system. We have an education system which is designed around memorization and then uh, vomiting out the answers at an arbitrary test and then forgetting them. Um, I think that we probably now at a point where jobs that require memorization of information or, or doing things by rules or, or doing things by measurement quite honestly can be done by machines. So we need an education system that perhaps nurtures human potential uh, rather than turns them into a, into a robot. We should program the machines, not be programmed by them, is what I'm suggesting. So my point isn't about memorization. It's not about lacking, not having content knowledge or content mastery, but the ability to apply it. Because if we can apply it, we're likely to, to memorize it better and to actually know how to use it. So I don't think it's a sort of either or. I don't think it's like content is bad and skills are good. I think that they both feed each other, actually. And I think we have an imbalance in the present education systems because they are largely controlled by multi-billion dollar corporations that have a vested interest in the scarcity of content and a measurement system that, that, that basically tests your memory recall. And that's, that's my, my key point. So I'm not, I'm not opposed to testing. I mean, I think a certain amount of diagnostic testing is, is valuable, uh, certainly for the learner, um, you know, because the learner would like to know how am I doing with this particular thing. So, I mean, you know, the, the learners do this outside of the school environment, you know, in video games and, and so forth. You know, they're constantly being assessed. And so that's, that's, there's nothing wrong with, with testing as long as there's a diagnostic. I think that when testing becomes the driving force of how we teach and what we teach, um, then it become, becomes a problem. So how do we get away from that, really? How do we, how do we move on? I mean, I think that it still has a place. I'm, I'm not suggesting that we, we remove the measurement industry entirely. What I'm thinking about is we need to have a, a public conversation about what are the things that we value. Now, when you come to to education forums all over the world, people will talk about the things that we value for uh, this century and the next century. You know, we talk about creativity, we talk about collaboration, we talk about critical thinking and so forth. But our measurement systems that we have today um, don't, don't really measure those. And, and they, they probably are unmeasurable because we actually measure what's easy, but we don't measure what we value. You know, so that's why I think in the keynotes that we heard this morning, a lot was talked about projects, about the way that we can demonstrate our ability to do things. Now, to give you a commercial, a, a, a real-world example, 
I hire software engineers um, in three continents at the moment, in China, in Europe, and in the United States. Now, I don't care where they went to university or what certificates that they have. I'm just not interested. What I do is I look at um, a, a, a thing called GitHub, which is very popular among software engineers. It's where they share their code, where they demonstrate um, their voodoo, if you like, in, in, in creating code, where they collaborate and everything else. I look at that, and that determines whether the, the, I'm interested in interviewing them uh, and even hiring them, because that actually shows me what they can do. And that doesn't mean that they haven't got knowledge. It doesn't mean that they didn't sit tests or maths, for example, or an A-level or a degree or whatever. But it tells me what they can do with that information. As we know, there's an awful lot of people that have lots of certificates and, and letters behind their name, but aren't that smart or not that practical. And so I think that we need ways of looking at this. So I don't think it's necessarily replacing the measurement industry, but it's at least having something that runs alongside it so that I can say, yes, you have this knowledge, but also you have these skills. And I think that's what's missing at the moment. A good teacher uses a repertoire of skills. So project-based learning is just one of many. Um, you know, if you look at the Finnish education system, it's, you know, they didn't switch as some of the media said, to, to project-based learning, what they do, they have subjects, they have subject knowledge throughout the year, but also within the new curriculum framework, they allow young people to use project-based learning to bring those together. So other frameworks, such as direct instruction, still very important. Um, you know, it's just the way that that direct instruction is then, is then applied. Uh, Problem-based learning is, is another way of doing it, where you've set a, set, set a specific problem. I think sometimes people confuse projects and problem-based learning. Project is where it's a project that means something to you and is contextually relevant. A problem might be something in, in entirely different, but you, you're wanting to see how, how they work that out. So there's a, a variety of, of different techniques, and we've um, talked about things, for example, like design thinking. Again, useful for certain types of things. Scientific, uh, the scientific method, scientific thinking is also valuable. And I think that young people, and you know, or any people actually coming out of an education system need to be conversant with these variety of different ways of, of thinking. And teachers should be allowed to use a repertoire of, of techniques, not, not just one. I wouldn't, wouldn't want um, you know, my children, for that matter, to go to a school that was solely based around project-based learning. It doesn't suit all children for a start. It doesn't suit all learners. Um, what I want is uh, as artisan teachers. You know, I don't want to hand my child over to a, to a technician. I want them to be an artisan, and that, that's really what I'm promoting. Well, I think in terms of global competencies that we need um, for certainly to thrive in this century and, and hopefully into the, into the next, I'm not sure whether they can actually be taught. Um, you know, can creativity be taught? Can critical thinking be taught? Um, can innovation be taught? I'm not entirely sure that they can be taught in the, in the traditional direct instruction sense, but I think we can create environments where they can, they can flourish, we create environments where it's permitted to think critically, um, it's permitted to be, uh, think outside the box and to be creative and, and to create environments where, where we collaborate. So I think that the, you know, certainly uh, being able to think critically, to be able to communicate, to be able to collaborate, to get on with each other, um, to think innovatively, to, 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 be, uh, to, to be innovative. I think these are all um, aspects of, of, of future competences that will allow all present and future generations to be ready for the future, which is going to change quite rapidly. Um, I think the key skill, the key thing that we need uh, with, 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 as I say, present and future generations is that they know how to learn. Because actually any job that they, they get, they confront, they're not going to know how to do. I think we can teach how to learn because I think that that's where we come down to um, projects, for example. I mean, so we, we've talked about project-based learning as one example of how you can learn how to learn. Now, think about what you do in your, in your own life. Um, you know, you, you embark on a variety of projects and you find things out along the way. You find things out because you, you, you start off, it's called the creative learning spiral. You, first of all, you imagine uh, a problem or a project and so forth and then you start working on that learning about that uh, try and then you iterate you, you build something for example and then you it doesn't work quite how you expected so you change things and you try things again and through that you learn 
and through that you build a competency of learning how to learn. So I think it's something that, um, yes, you can, you can teach by providing the environment which allows you to learn. I think at the moment we have an education system which is about consuming. I give you the information, you consume it, and then you repeat it at an exam. If we create an example where we give you some information and then give you the opportunity to have transference, you can transfer what I've just taught you to something else. To give you an example, and I'm, I'm running a workshop about this actually at this summit, you know, I, I, I'll teach uh, young people, or in this case, people from the summit, how to create an electrical circuit that turns a light on, and then how to write the code to turn the light on and off. But then I say to them, having taught them that, okay, how, what if you're blind? Can you transfer what I just taught you into turning a buzzer on and off? And you'd be surprised that they can. So they've learned something, and they've learned how to learn. So I think the, um, in the context of, of education and, and my, my passion uh, for, for this and what brings me here, I think one of the things that, the, that affected me was spending time with a gentleman called Seymour Papert, uh, who was an artificial intelligence pioneer and educator from MIT, and um, really regarded as the father of, of uh, learning theory called constructionism. Papert was a, uh, a student of Piaget, um, and um, through, through that, he, he developed this way of believing that um, computers would profoundly change learning and, and teaching in a way that it would give young people uh, or any learner better things to do. So rather than uh, education as a transmission of knowledge, it was a reconstruction of knowledge you'd learn by, by doing. Now, I had the opportunity to meet him when I was uh, 17 um, as a result of um, having helped port uh, the logo computer language from a mini computer at MIT to a microcomputer. And then the company I was working for at that time um, sponsored his speaking tour uh, around a number of universities in England. So I had the opportunity of driving him around as a sort of taxi driver for, a, for a, 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 just over a week. And at the time I was like 17, I had blue hair, I was into punk music and I was busy playing you know, things like Sex Pistols and New York Dolls, all this punk music. But he was also fascinated in my background um, in terms of self-directed learning. Um, and he was telling me about his theory. So unbeknownst to me, really, because I was a 17-year-old young man, um, that I was sitting next to somebody who was um, a real thinker and a, and a real mover in the terms of changing education. And his theories are why I'm here now. I mean, he, a lot of what I'm talking about in terms of constructionism, social constructionism, learning by making and learning through experiential learning really comes from that man. He was the guy that, if you like, lit my fire and passion for education.